it. Um, a food that is both bitter and sour. I just can't figure that one out. It's not lemons, is it? Or pickle? Um, I, I don't know something can be a base and acidic. You know, like, it's just, I just don't know. Not pickles, but you're correct on lemons. Okay. Why? Well, what happens when you... Uh, <clears throat> well, I mean, if you eat the fruit of a lemon, it's sour, right? Mm -hmm. What about the peel? Oh, you're right. And don't they contain both ascorbic acid and citric acid? Yeah. But, I don't know if that has something to do with that. But. Nope, nothing to do with it. That just okay. means that, okay. that the ascorbic acid and um, citric acid are in the fruit, not in the peel. Okay. Cool. I was agonizing over that question out of all of them. It's kind of funny. Like, all right. What else we got? What's the thing that holds the test tubes upright? It looks kind of like in the kit. Um, I don't think there's a test tube rack in the kit. I just used the 150 milliliter beaker, and I think I used a plastic bag. <laughs> to fill it to the rest of the way, just so they would be straight up. Okay. But There's if, a little plastic tray with a bunch of holes in it that are numbered. I don't know what that's for, but I use that and just as to sit up right in that. Yeah. Right, I got the kit right here, so let me look. It's, uh, it's called the... Oh. Um, oh, they actually fit in those wells? Wow. They do. They don't stand completely upright, but it props them up to where they don't fall over and spill. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, I guess that, that works. But yeah, there isn't a test tube rack, which is what that would be called. All right, what else we got? People are all over the board with turning in chapter summaries. Got some people working on seven and turning seven in and then six, five, four, and just had a three turned in, which is kind of late. Does anybody want to talk about any Acid based stuff or nuclear fission, nuclear fusion. Can you go over nuclear fission? That I don't, it confuses me. Sure. Let me share. Let's see. Let me come over here. Do pictures. Thanks. Huh. The picture is not there. Hmm. All right, uh, let's go here and go there and go there and go there. All right, so share, share. Okay, do you guys see this uh, nuclear equation thing I have on the screen? Yes. Okay, so this reaction right here, the one that starts with the neutron and the uranium, this is nuclear fission. This is the full nuclear reaction. So this isn't really chemistry anymore. This is, you'd have to, you'd have to call this nuclear chemistry because chemistry deals with electrons and this doesn't, don't care about electrons with this. So what you have is this uranium 230, uh, 235 atom, and to it, you shoot a neutron into it. You're, are we okay with what a neutron is? I'm not actually sure who I'm talking to. <laughs> who asked that question? Casey. Okay, Casey, do you know what a neutron is then? Do you remember what that is? 
You can go over it. So we've got, uh, well, I better pull up. Well, um, I think it was chapter two when they were talking, maybe it was chapter one. We were talking about protons, neutrons, and electrons. And those are the substances that the atom is composed of. So the protons and the neutrons are in the nucleus and they have a mass of one. The proton has a positive charge and the neutron has no charge and the electron has a negative charge. So the neutron is in the nucleus basically so that the protons that are in the nucleus don't have to sit right on top of each other. Have you ever tried to put the same side of two different magnets next to each other? They push away from each other. So protons do the same thing. They're both positively charged, so they want to push away from each other. So instead of having to shove the neutrons right against each other, you shove a couple of neutrons in between them, and it acts as a buffer. So they don't have to sit right on top of each other. So if you had a really powerful, two really powerful magnets and you tried to shove the norths together, they would push apart. But if you put like a, um, I don't know, like a book down, on its side and then put the two magnets as close to each other with the book in the way would probably be no problem so that that neutron can disrupt a nucleus and that's what's happening in this reaction so in this nuclear reaction this uranium atom that has a total mass of 235 has a neutron that goes into its nucleus and so now this arrow is showing for a moment this becomes uranium 236 so that neutron was added to the uranium this is really unstable, and so what ends up happening is the, the nucleus, this, now this uranium-236, bursts apart into a rubidium atom and a cesium atom and three more neutrons. Does that make sense? Yes. So when you're looking at these numbers here, on each side of arrows, the things on the top and the things on the bottom have to all add up. So this is 92 and zero. So then on the other side of the arrow, it has to equal 92 and it does. So this is 235 and one, and then that equals 236. So on this other side, I've got 37 and 55, and that equals 92 because the neutron doesn't have a charge. And then the, over here, I also need to add up to 236. So there's 93 in the rubidium, 140 in the cesium, and there's three neutrons, each with a mass of one, and that adds you up to 236. So when this happens, the other thing that occurs is you get a whole bunch of energy, tons and tons of energy. And that energy is used as a heat source um, to basically boil water is usually what it's used for. Unless you're using it for a bomb, then it's used as a bomb. But um, you end up with this rubidium isotope and the cesium isotope and these three neutrons. So the rubidium and cesium aren't that important. They, they, uh, not for the reaction. They sort of just like byproducts that you don't want. But now that I have these three neutrons that were just created, what could one of these three neutrons do? They could find another uranium-235 atom that's in the fuel and make this reaction happen again. Does that make sense? Yes. So what happens if all three of those neutrons find different uranium-235s or to react with? The, they just continue to combust and multiply? Yeah, but not combust. Combust isn't the right word. So you'll get this neutron hitting this uranium-235 and splitting into two pieces and three more neutrons. And then those split into three um, three pieces. And then you get you, each one of those generates three. So we go from one to three to nine to 27. And so you can see that this is an exponential increase that can get out of hand very quickly. And if we're talking about a nuclear bomb, that's what makes it a nuclear bomb. You just let it do what it wants to do, which is get out of control. But if it's in a nuclear power plant, I only want it to be, I don't want it to be out of control. I, I want it to generate a bunch of energy, but not too much energy. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. But so how do you stop it from continuing to create more energy? Okay, so one thing that needs to happen is the uranium-235 atoms need to be close enough to where the neutrons are being generated to be hit. And another thing that needs to happen is, can you see in this picture where it talks about the moderator or it shows a picture of something called a moderator? Yes. That literally is regular water. There isn't anything odd about it. So what happens is when this 
uh, when this uranium-235 splits into this rubidium and cesium and these three neutrons, these neutrons are moving at like 90% of the speed of light. And if we don't slow them down, then they'll just fly into the shielding and be absorbed by the shielding inside the reactor and not do anything at all. So what we need to do is we need to have those neutrons slowed down. So what happens is this reaction happens in something called a fuel rod, and then the neutrons come out and they run into water, which is around the fuel rods. And as they run into water, they slow down in the same way that when somebody hits a pool cue ball, it's moving really fast. And then when it hits the rest of the balls, it slows down a lot. So this bounces through the moderator, the water, and slows down enough so then it can go into the next fuel rod and blow up some uranium-235s. And so you can keep that process happening, but what we want ultimately is there to be a, like a steady state where only one of the three neutrons is blowing up the next uranium-235. And so the other thing you can use is something called a control rod. And so spaced out in between the fuel rods are things called control rods. And what you can do is insert the control rods at different depths. And what the control rods do is when a, uh, a neutron comes flying by it, it just absorbs it and then nothing happens. It doesn't blow up, it just gets bigger. And so in the what you end up having is some neutrons that are actually fissioning other uranium 235s, but um, two out of three don't do anything at all. They get absorbed by shielding or they get absorbed by control rods. That way we can control how much energy. So initially we want it to keep building up till it gets to a certain level. And then we want it to just um, stay at that steady state, full power. Is that helpful at all? Yes, thank you. Sure. Is there a reason that nuclear power plants aren't as popular? Oh uh, yeah, there's a really good reason for that. So first off, let's, uh, let me find, where, where'd that go? Uh, so I, I said earlier that this rubidium atom and this cesium atom weren't important to the reaction, and they're not. But they still have an importance in the fact that they're radioactive for a long, long time. Okay. I mean a long time, like hundreds of thousands of years. So what do you do with it? Well, you, uh, you try to find a place to put it, and we don't have a place to put it. So, like, Hanford has been storing it for decades, and it leaks into the Columbia River because it's difficult to contain. Because you try to put these things in metal containers, but these end up generating charged particles. So it's basically, and, and heat. So what do you think happens to metal if it's exposed to um, charged particles and heat? Well, Rhodes melts. No, it doesn't melt, but it rusts, which is exactly oh, what's right. happened. All the containers that they made in the 40s and 50s, they've all rusted. And so they're just leaking into the water supply and leaking into the Columbia. So obviously that's horrible. Um, yeah. So that's a, a really good reason not to like nuclear fission is because you get waste products that you can't really deal with. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's an, another reason, and I can't remember if I have the picture in here or not. It's kind of eerie, like driving by old ones. Like I think there's one in Oregon that there's this big nuclear power plant or whatever, but it, like they didn't even finish building it. There's no. just this huge structure. No, that's not true. Well, what is it then? Um, uh, I'm gonna tell my dad he was wrong. Yeah, that was called Trojan Nuclear Power Plant. Okay. And it was an operating nuclear power plant. And then when it reached its end of life, they just took it apart. Okay, but there's still that's the one there's still one that's standing though. Nope. It's not used. You know, oh really? Nope. Maybe in the times. How long ago were you talking about seeing this this cooling tower? I don't remember. My brain's getting old worse with age. What are we sorry, what, what question did you just ask me? I got distracted. Oh, fine. Um, I said my brain is just starting to get more, I don't remember dates as well anymore, but I think it was, I thought it was like a few years ago, but I could be wrong. Oh, no, no, you were asking me, sorry, I know why nuclear power isn't more 
more popular. Oh, oh, the actual question. Okay. All right. So. Um, this is half the reason. Can you oh. can you see that? Uh huh. So this movie came out in 77, 78. And mm -hmm. um, these are, I mean, you probably know those names, at least. I was going to say the good cast. Right. It's a, it's a good cast. So uh, it was a popular movie and it scared the hell out of people. The, pr the premise of this movie was that the company that was building this nuclear power plant used shoddy materials. Oh, okay. And Jack Lemon works at the plant and he's a good guy. And Jane Fonda is a reporter who usually does puff pieces. And Michael Douglas is like an environmental activist that tries to get her involved. So they find out that that is actually the case. And um, the company, like, obviously is upset with them for investigating it and tried to go after them. But the China syndrome, that that was a term that somebody created in the 30s or 40s and what it what was supposed to what it, what it meant was that you'd have a nuclear power plant have a meltdown and the nuclear core would be so hot it would melt through the containment facility it would melt through the ground it would go right through the earth and then pop out at the other side at, in china oh my god so completely and utterly stupid for many many reasons <laughs> one would be Let's say it made it to the center of the earth. Gravity would keep it there, right? Yeah. It's not like it would defy gravity and move to China, but whatever. So this movie in and itself wasn't good enough to scare people, but let's find the, the other picture. Do, 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 do. And then did like a nuclear power plant fail or something? And, and then a nuclear power plant had a problem. So, do, 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 do. Do. let's see. Can I open that in a new tab? Put that right there. And zoom, zoom, zoom. And then I will post it there. So, at basically the same time that that movie came out. Um, a nuclear power plant at Three Mile Island, which is um, a, a, an island that's three miles long. Um, it's in the Susquehanna River, and it's basically at the border of, of Maryland and Pennsylvania. It's technically in Pennsylvania. And the power plant um, uh, released some radioactive gas into the atmosphere. And uh, yeah, those two things in combination with each other scared people enough where they weren't willing to build nuclear power plants anymore. Um, no one, no one's going to, uh, no one would have suffered anything because of the, the release. It was actually very little material that went into the air, but it still scared people enough where we're just going to turn ourselves off to nuclear power. Um, but really, I mean, it's a good idea because we don't have any place to put the nuclear waste. We were going to put it in a mountain in Nevada and Harry Reid, who was in charge of the Senate at the time when they were making this decision, just stonewalled it and basically said, no, it's not going there. So now we don't have any place to put it. Even though the federal government is um, legally obligated to take the nuclear waste, because that was part of the agreement that, all right, I'm a nuclear power plant, I'm, or I'm a company who's going to build a nuclear power plant. How do I get rid of the waste? And the federal government said, you pay us a certain amount of money while you're building the plant as a tax. And that tax will be used exclusively to take care of the nuclear waste you generate. Except we don't have any place to put it. So these poor companies are just putting it in barrels in water and leaving it right next to the nuclear power plant. Does that sound like a good idea? No, like a very bad one. Sounds like a very bad idea. It is a very bad idea, but we still don't have any political power to get this thing taken care of. It should go in that that uh, facility that we've already built in that mountain in Nevada, but for some reason the executive branch has just not done it. I I can't give a good reason why, but they've just decided that that's not going to happen. They 
I mean, Obama and or Trump could say, yeah, we're going to take it there. Too bad. That's where it's going because it's a federal facility and it's the best place for it. But uh, pushback from Arizona people, it's, it's a bunch of NIMBA, that not in my backyard kind of stuff. I mean, who wants a nuclear power plant in their state? The funny thing is the people who where Yucca Mountain is, Yucca Mountain is, they want that there because they are positive that it's going to generate a whole bunch of jobs for them. And, and it would. Um, all right. Yeah, that's pretty much what I got for that. Let me show something else for Casey. Uh, can we see this thing here? Yes. So these are fuel rods. Um, some of them are fuel rods and some of them are control rods. So that nuclear reaction happens in one of these and then it scoots over to the next side and then that allows the reaction to occur. And then if I insert the rods, then none of the neutrons make it to another uranium. So they, um, they get absorbed and, and the nuclear reaction turns off. So if you wanted the nuclear power plant to stop operating, you'd shove all of the rods in at the same time and then nothing can happen. That thing looks intimidating. <laughs> uh, I've seen three. I don't know if I'd say intimidating. I always look at it as, wow, that's a lot of, of great engineering. Yeah, it's just a lot of metal. It's a lot of metal. It's a it's an odd metal. It's uh, these rods are made out of a metal called hafnium. Yeah. Hafnium and zirconium are always found alloyed together in nature, and it's difficult to separate them out. And uh, a company named uh, Wa Chang, which is actually in Albany, figured it out. So, oh. so yeah, Albany, Oregon. Oh, that's where I was born. Armpit of Oregon. Well, when the paper mill is still going. Uh, that paper mill is not going anymore? I don't think so. But then again, I thought that power plant was still up, so. I know, I know it doesn't smell like it used oh, to. Oh, it used to smell like just gross. For some reason, I don't know what it is about paper mills, but they make, they smell like farts. Yeah. I remember when they were changing the speed limit to 70 miles an hour on the freeway that there was somebody who made the suggestion that we put it at 70 miles an hour all over the place, except for Albany, where we would make it 120. <laughs> well, that's good. I like that. Um, okay, what else you guys got? I'm gonna talk about. Did you um, see the the sketch that looks kind of like this in the, in the book? Yeah. So, do you know how we make electricity? No, actually, would you go over that for me? Because that's actually still kind of an enigma to me. I mean, I, we read about it a lot in one of our previous chapters about how, you know, we use combustion to power turbines that then send electricity through wires, but it's still kind of vague to me, you know, not. So do you know how electricity gets generated in general? Uh -uh. So a picture, a, a, a metal coat hanger. Okay. And um, a horseshoe magnet. Okay. And if you took the horseshoe magnet and passed it back and forth across the hanger, the hanger would generate electricity. Or if you held the magnet still, and just pass the hanger back and forth through it, there would be electricity generated in the, in the hanger. So all okay. you need is a current carrying conductor, so like a wire and a magnetic field, and you need to move one of them next to the other. That's it. There isn't anything else to it. So if you were holding that coat hanger with your bare hands and yeah. you did that, would it shock you? Absolutely not, because you wouldn't be able to generate very much voltage. Okay. You need for you to feel it as a healthy adult, you need it to be somewhere in the 80 range to feel it through your hands. Okay. If, you're, if it's not at 80 volts, you wouldn't notice it. Um, you know, like how you can put a nine volt battery on your tongue and feel it. 
Uh -huh. but you could put your thumb on top of the nine volt battery and not feel anything at all. Yeah. It's because water conducts it. For... Well, it's not just water. It's that there's a bunch of the saliva has a bunch of ions in it. So like okay. salts and whatnot. And so that conducts oh. it. So if there are, if there isn't basically a salt water solution and electrolyte, then it doesn't get transferred easily. You, it has to be at a very high voltage to hurt you. Okay. And your skin just doesn't have enough of that stuff on it unless you're out running and you're you're sweating, then yes, of course, you would have stuff on you that could cause cause you to be able to feel it. But it wouldn't be able to hurt you. Um, so not water without moment. salts will produce less of a charge. Water without salts is a non-conductor. It's, it's as conductive as plastic. But like if you're taking a bath and you throw a toaster in it, even if there's no salt in there, I guess there's salt on your skin. Yes. But like if there's completely no salt whatsoever in a bowl of water. And nothing. you put something. Nothing would happen. Really? No. That's so crazy. It's a non-conductor. It's practically <laughs> impossible to get all of the salt off of a toaster and all of the salt out of a bathtub and all of the salt out of water. But if you did do it and you threw it in there, nothing would happen. That's so crazy. On my mind. I'm still not going to experiment with it, but that's really interesting to know. Well, that's good because <laughs> enough people have died every year. Like a dozen people die from that still. I don't get it. I just don't get it. I don't get how it happened. There was a, like a 15 year old girl that died last year charging her iPhone while she was in the tub. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. It's really tragic. Mm, I don't, yeah, I'm not there with you. Tragic no, is not. Like, you're like Dur Darwinian survival of the fittest. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I think it's kind of silly whenever you like, or, I, for some reason, this is like a common imagery in movies. Like people have a TV in front of their bathtub, and I'm like, what? Was this ever really a thing? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure I've seen those movies that have TVs near their bathtubs. Oh. But I definitely wouldn't want a television to fall in the tub because the television itself, especially if it's an old CRT television, doesn't need to be plugged in because they're constantly, their capacitor is constantly charged and that thing would blow you up immediately. Oh, Jesus. There's another thing I didn't know. I didn't know you can throw a TV in a bathtub without it being plugged in and it kill you. Well, we're talking about old televisions, <laughs> the large ones with the big tube in the back. Yep. Yeah. Th never touch those things. <laughs> never touch the inside of those things. So the, um, the generator itself, the electrical generator, this is basically an axle with a bunch of wires on it with magnets around it. And if you spin the axle with the magnets around it, electricity gets generated. So it's our, our um, horseshoe magnet hanger discussion, except this thing's huge. And when I mean huge, I mean the axle with the wires around it. This is the Dallas Dam on the right. And this is a mock-up of what it would look like on the inside. That's a person. Whoa. So this thing is huge. Yeah, I didn't even make it that, that was a person at first because it's so big. It's hard to... So you need to spin this. And if you spin this, then the magnets around the exterior cut a magnetic th field through the wires and then you generate electricity. So how do you spin something that heavy? Well, you build a giant dam and you have large quantities of water, um, hit a turbine and spin it. Well, what if you don't have a dam around? So what we have decided to do is this thing here that says steam turbine, this is the thing that gets hit with steam that is directly connected to the electrical generator. To the that axle so if this thing spins then this thing spins so in essence all electrical generating plants except for the solar ones uh and um and dams they're just giant water boilers that's it there's nothing else to it i need to boil water so i can make steam and this steam turns this turbine and when this turbine turns and then the generator turns and you get yourself electricity so in a nuclear power plant, how do you get steam? So you have this, um, this water called feed water. It hits this pipe and this pipe is like 500 degrees. Well, what, do you, what, what happens if you've got your stovetop on, on high 
and a drop of water touches it. Practically instantly evaporates? Yes, almost instantaneously it turns into steam. Well, that's what's happening here. This water flashes into steam, that steam goes through a pipe, hits this turbine, and the turbine spins. And so then you get electricity. So how do I get this super hot pipe? So inside of here, this is the, this little thing right here, these black lines with the gray around the exterior, that's called the fuel assembly where the uranium-235 is or the plutonium-239, whichever it is that you're using. And these are the control rods. So I have some, some uh, water, this whole thing is filled with water. And so I got this pump and I pump water in here and then this water travels up in between the fuel rods and while it's traveling in between the fuel rods it gets heated and so then it gets pumped through this pipe and gets pumped into this thing here called the steam generator which you know generates steam and so the water enters this side at about 525 degrees and it goes through a series of pipes and then it comes out at about 500 degrees the reason it cooled off was because the water that comes in here is at about 70 degrees and it hits this pipe that's 525 degrees and blam turns into steam so this water that's inside of here that passes through the nuclear power plant it it's just a loop it gets pumped it goes through it goes to the top of the steam generator it gets cooled off as it comes down and then it gets pumped and it gets heated cooled heated cooled nothing ever happens to it it never leaves this area in four and a half years that I was on the aircraft carrier, none of this water ever came out, ever. So nothing radioactive is gonna come out of this, this containment facility. All the radiation is stored inside this fuel assembly. The water doesn't actually even touch the radioactive material. It just passes by it because the radio radiation is inside a can and the can gets hot. And the water passes by this hot can and heats up from 500 to 525 and then cools down in here because it's boiling water and then heats it up again. So this is shown with the control rods fully inserted. So this thing would be turned off or was just turned off. As soon as those control rods go in, then no more nuclear reactions occur and this fuel, this fuel assembly cools down to basically room temperature. So I've got this loop of primary water, primary loop, and then I have this other loop over here where the water comes in, hits the pipe, boils to steam. And then when it comes out the backside of the turbine, it's like bathroom steam, like it's not useful. So what I need to do, since you can't move steam very easily, you, uh, you have it hit a cold pipe and that cold pipe liquefies it, it condenses it. And then I pump that water back in and it turns to steam and water and steam and water. This is your secondary loop. The cool thing about this is the water that's inside the primary loop and the water in the secondary loop, they never come in contact with each other. This is inside a pipe, and this is on the outside of the pipe, so they never touch. So how do I get this, this pipe right here cold? So the thing that you recognize as a nuclear power plant is the thing called the cooling tower. And the cooling tower basically looks like a, uh, a water slide, a pipe that's corkscrewing down the inside of it. And so what you have is like a river or a lake or some other water supply. And this is called the cooling loop. And the cooling loop just pumps water up to the top of the cooling tower and dumps water on these pipes. And these pipes are warm. So the water evaporates and that's why you see a cloud looking thing coming out of the top of these cooling towers because it's a cloud. So this water cascades down, rains down like a waterfall on top of this. When it gets to the bottom, they pump it back into the lake or river or wherever the water's coming from, and then they pump it back up. And so this water that's in this lake, river, or the ocean just goes up to the top, rains down on top of these pipes, never touches what's inside of it, goes back where it came from, gets pumped back out, and goes back up to the top. So the cooling loop never comes in contact with the condensing loop, and the condensing loop just gets pumped into the condenser where hot steam hits it on the outside and it gets it warm. And so then I pump the, this water and the condensing loop through these pipes. And on the outside of the pipes, I'm raining water down on it, which is evaporating. And just like if you lick the back of your hand and blow on it, um, it, your hand gets cold. When the water evaporates off these pipes, it cools the pipe and then that cools the water inside of it. 
So what you have are four fully separate loops that never come in contact with each other. This water never touches that water, which never touches this water, which never touches this water. And so you can't have a leak from say the fuel assembly. So to get it into the river, this thing here would have to break. Then this thing here would have to break. Then this thing here would have to break. And then this thing here would have to break. And all of these pumps would have to keep pumping. What do you think happens if any one of these things breaks? The pumps stop going? They turn everything off. So you can't get water into the lake or river. So how did the Fukushima accident happen? Everything broke at the same time because it got was an earthquake and then it got hit by a tsunami. So what was the problem with that plant? Don't don't build your nuclear power plant next to the ocean on a fault line. That that was the problem with the nuclear power plant. It had nothing to do with the plant. It was some stupid person put a nuclear power plant on a fault line next to the ocean. Is that a problem? Well, obviously it was a problem. Isn't it still a problem? I, I heard that it's still leaking. Well, there isn't anything to leak per se, but okay. it's still very radioactive and that radiation is still just all in the ground and whatnot all over the place. So every time it rains, the stuff that's in the dirt ends up in the ocean. You, did you make a reference to an aircraft carrier? Uh, yes. What was that about? I was on an aircraft carrier. For, oh, you really were? Were you in the military? I was in the Navy for four and a half years. Or oh. sorry, I was in the Navy for six years. I was on that boat for four and a half years. Sweet. I did not know that. No, that that's not sweet. <laughs> no, really. My sister's husband's in the Navy. It's, it. it's terrible. <laughs> you didn't like it, it sounds like? <laughs> no, I got out as fast as I could. Yeah. Okay, so I uh, just what did we just say about uh, building a nuclear power plant on a fault line next to the water? Don't do it. Idea. Yeah, this is in California. Oh my God. Um, well, maybe we're maybe you're not aware, but California sits on top of a fault line. Oh, that's Camp Pendleton, isn't it? Uh, no, it's not. No, that's not Camp Pendleton. It's maybe. 20 miles away from Camp Pendleton? Because those boob looking things, there's a couple of those in Camp Pendleton. But maybe, I think, actually, you know what? Those are further apart than those two are. Yeah, this is um, uh, Orenko. I think that's what it's called. Uh, no, San, San, or, somebody say that for me. That word right there. <laughs> I don't know how to say that. Well, that's where the nuclear power plant is, right next to the water like that. Right there on a fault line. This thing should be decommissioned. But why why are these power plants not why is this power plant in a bad spot not being decommissioned? Uh, because they probably need I don't know. Because it costs a lot of money. Yeah. A lot of power. It generates a lot of electricity and California is electricity starved, so they're not gonna do it. Which they're just playing with fire with this. Um do you remember just a little while ago, I was talking about that movie where the people who built the nuclear power plant used bad parts, cheap parts to save themselves yep. money. Mm -hmm. Why would that, why would a company not do that? Why would they not, not use bad parts? Yeah, why would a nuclear, why would a company like, um, Port, let's say Portland General Electric was gonna build a nuclear power plant. Why would they not build it with bad parts? Does that make it liable? Okay, more liability is one thing, but that's not the most important thing. What else we got? It'll make more money in the long run if it lasts longer, right? That's exactly it. So when I put when I when it cost me two billion dollars to build a nuclear power plant, I want that two billion dollars back. I can't get that two billion dollars plant back if after five years a part breaks and the nuclear power plant's offline. When you build a nuclear power plant. You want it to run all, you want it to run 24 seven, 365, because as it's running, it's making you money. So the reason that that would never happen at a facility purposefully is, and the reason I know that it hasn't happened is because most of these nuclear power plants that have been built or that are operating right now were built 40 or 50 years ago. 
they were only designed to function for 25 years. They're all supposed to be decommissioned after 25 years, but they haven't been because if they did, uh, you'd have like rolling brownouts in Los Angeles County. A uh, rolling brownout is when there's not enough electricity to power everything everybody needs. And uh, the, the incandescent light bulb goes from being that nice sunlight color to being kind of brown and then your power trips off. So nobody wants that because the last time that happened in California in the 90s, a bunch of old people died because they overheated because their air conditioners tripped off because they lost power. So even though these nuclear power plants are, in some cases, two decades past their expiration date and they're still operating, the reason they can still operate is because when they built the nuclear power plants, they built them to last because they wanted to make tons and tons of money off of this. Does that make sense? Yeah. You build something that can make you money, and if you build it well, you can keep using that same thing, and you don't have to use any capital to build another thing. It just keeps working year after year. I mean, if you're a, a plumber, you want to buy, like, one plumber's wrench, right? One of those pipe wrenches. You don't want to have to buy a pipe wrench every year. You just want to buy one and then use it for your entire career, and that's kind of how nuclear power plants are built. Because you, you want them to check everything out. You want them to find anything that's bad because you want that thing to just keep making you money. Every time anything bad in this world is protected, I think it all really boils down to money. Uh, yeah, it, it's always boiling down to money. Yeah. Or, or religion, which, yeah, which, was, which was money too. Yeah, I think religion is a huge money maker. Oh yeah. It's not like a business, it's a business. Do you ever watch John Oliver? I love John Oliver. Did you see that time when he made himself a nonprofit church? No, I haven't seen that one. I'll you should watch, watch that one. Because okay. all of a sudden he was getting he get, he got like almost a hundred thousand dollars worth of donations in less than a month. And he fr he freaked out. He's like, I I don't want this, I don't want to get in trouble for this. So he like like, uh, I don't know, decommissioned or whatever, the 5031C, and then took all the money and very publicly gave it to a charity. Yeah. <laughs> Just to show I, I do not, I did not take any of this money and I have receipts to prove it. <laughs> okay, what else? What else? I think that was probably a pretty good explanation quick explanation of nuclear power I'm sure as soon as we get off of this video chat I'll think of something to ask you just you know. fire me off an email oh. okay um Casey, Becca, anything? Okay. I'm sorry, I do have one last question. Go for it. Um, okay, so the question that I answered for this week, you know, questions and answers section. Did you answer the question about curium? Yeah, but like, I kind of did like a bunch of research and I found the answer, but like, I don't really understand it. So I want to know why. How, how do you get that? Uh, what, um, can you guys see this whiteboard? Yeah. Okay. So you, um, the question, I can't remember who posted it, but whatever it was um, about California. Mm -hmm. Oops, sorry. I'll erase that. This is how you write a particular isotope. So let me write an easier one. Let's say, uh, um, I almost felt like I was cheating on accident because I didn't fully understand it. So, so this, 
this is the proton number uh -huh. for carbon and this is the total mass so uh -huh. in this particular atom i'm talking about a carbon so it's got six protons so six protons but the mass is 14 so that means it's got eight neutrons in it uh -huh. so up here this is californium all californium atoms have 98 protons and so the rest of this the other 200 or 147 are neutrons does that make sense wait. there may so wait so, so this number right here okay that number right there is the proton number plus the neutron number and that's called the total mass yeah and then you you divide that in half to get your right. neutron number no right? i just just subtract subtract okay so this is this Californium has a mass of 245. We know it has 98 protons and all the rest of it are neutrons. So if I subtract off 98 off of this, I get 147. So that's telling me that there's 147 neutrons. Okay. Okay. So in that problem, it said um, they shot an alpha particle at something and they want to know what that something is. But when, when this reaction occurred, I got a Californium 245 and I got a neutron. And a neutron has no protons in it, so no charge, and it's got a mass of one. So, and I was told it was an alpha particle. So an alpha particle has a mass of four and has two protons total. So it's got two protons and two neutrons. And so the question is, what's this other thing? What was the isotope that they shot the alpha particle at? So everything up top has to equal on both sides of the arrow. Everything on the bottom has to equal on both sides of the arrow. So on this side of the arrow, this total um, positive number down here is 98, 0 plus 98. So this 2 plus something over here has to equal 98. So then this thing is 96. Okay. So that's curium. And so then you have to figure out, well, what's the mass of this curium? Well, over here, this is 245 plus 1. So on this side of the arrow, it's got a total mass of 246. Mm -hmm. And I know four of it is an alpha particle. So that means that this thing has to have a mass of 242 because 242 what? and four equals 246. So it's literally just a little bit of addition and subtraction. Okay. I'm going to take a picture of that just so I can. Sure. I'm also recording this one. So I'll, it'll be on YouTube. Yeah. Right. Oh, thank you. That's a lot simpler than I thought. I did so much reading up on it after finding the answer, and I kind of got it, but I just wanted to see the math done broken down like that. So thanks. Sure. Okay. That that about it? Something else? All I've got 